For those of you watching online, please forgive the interruption. <laughs> We're trying to figure this out. Wouldn't Jesus have been so much more effective if he had had a microphone? <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you all. I don't know what's going on with this thing, but uh, anyway. Father, thank you for the opportunity to serve you, and thank you that um, thank you for all the technical opportunities and advantages that we have that we can do ministry here this morning and literally be available around the world. And uh, we only notice when sometimes these things don't work the way they're supposed to. But thank you that you're not uh, limited or thwarted by any uh, temporary inconvenience like that. And we thank you that you are risen and you are Lord and your kingdom is a reality. And we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. I once went to a meeting and met a guy that I'd never met before, and his greeting to me just really took me off guard. He met me with the words, what do they call you where you come from? <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, I was a little bit annoyed by it because he, he did it with sort of a, a sarcastic tone, and I was a little bit annoyed by it, but I certainly never forgot it. What do they call you from where you come from, where you come from? Well, you know, you think about that, and you think about our names that we typically don't name ourselves. Our parents name us. That's the reason when we do uh, baby dedications around here, one of the first questions I always ask the parent is, what is the child's name, and why is this the child's name? And I think that's important for us to know as we grow older, as there's nothing that we're identified with more than our name. And, uh, and in fact, in the Bible, names are a big deal. And names have meaning and significance. And so says, should they be for us. But then you, you think about, in addition, though, nicknames. H how many of us raise your hand if you have a nickname or have had a nickname by someone? Okay, all right. Now, here's the sec second question. How many of us... created our own nickname i mean how many how many of us had somebody else give us our nickname let's put it that way right because that's the way it typically works isn't it the majority of us somebody else gives you a nickname they notice something about you that's a characteristic um, of you that is something that stands out to them and they come up with a nickname for that i think just about all of our children and grandchildren we've come up with some kind of a of, of, a, of a tweak of their, of their given name that's a nickname that we affectionately use to refer to them. And most of the time, nicknames are affectionate. Now, there are times they're not. Sometimes people give us nicknames that are not desirable or sought after uh, and maybe characteristics of which we're not so proud. But the bottom line is that nicknames are typically given us by someone else to identify some unique characteristic that they notice in us. Well, with that in mind, as we conclude our last Sunday of the Year of the Evangelist, as we look at Matthew through Acts, we're going to go today to Acts chapter 11, and we're going to begin with verse 19. We're going to read through this passage and talk through it and, and see how... God can use this to teach us truth about himself and ourself that is significant for our lives in Christ and with him. So we begin in Acts chapter 11, talking about the ministry of the first followers of Jesus. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Now, that sentence is packed with information. Let's unpack it just for the context. First of all, we remember back in Acts chapter 7 that Stephen, one of the early disciples of Jesus, was killed by the unbelieving uh, Jewish people in Jerusalem for his identification of himself and his allegiance to Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, and he was stoned to death. Now, Saul of Tarsus, 
later and also known as Paul the Apostle, the Bible says, was a, in agreement with that and a participant in that event and actually used that event as a springboard to go to the religious authorities and get permission to go to Damascus in Syria and find other Jewish people who were following Jesus as the Messiah, arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem to be uh, tried and presumably sentenced for their blasphemous heretical views of believing that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah of Israel. Now, it wasn't just a springboard for, the, for Paul, Saul of Tarsus. It also was a springboard for um, the opponents of the followers of Jesus at large in Jerusalem because it says those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution. So there was an outbreak of opposition to followers of Jesus in Jerusalem generally that got them out of town. Now, why is that significant? Just a... a, a a secondary thought here is that Jesus had clearly given them a mandate repeatedly before he ascended back to heaven after his resurrection that they were supposed to go all over and tell everybody about him, right? But yet at the same time, they didn't get out of town and start spreading the news until they got persecuted. So, God allowed them to be persecuted to actually fulfill his command in their life. Now, I'm saying that to say that um, so many times in our life, there are those of us who have been intentional and serious about following Jesus. And we've, we've made up our mind we're going to follow the Lord. And yet it seems that in following him, that sometimes things have gotten worse, not better, in our circumstances of our life. In other words, th things don't always work out the way they thought we thought they would when we decided to trust Jesus and follow Him. Can anybody identify with that? Okay? Right. All right. We view that as a failure or a negative much of the time. I would say that the stoning of Stephen and the persecution of the believers in Jerusalem wasn't something that was pleasant or enjoyable in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But God used that tragedy to be triumph as the scattering of the believers actually allowed them to fulfill the mandate that Jesus had given them to spread the good news to everybody that needed to hear. The Bible from Genesis through Revelation is the account of God turning what is tragedy for us into triumph for Him and us. That's the essence of of God's work in our lives. Edith Schaefer, the late Edith and uh, Francis Schaefer from several decades ago, Edith Schaefer uh, once said that life on this side of eternity is like looking at the back side of a needlepoint tapestry. I'm sure there are those of you here that do needlepoint or have needlepoint, and you, you look at the back side of it, and it's just a, a maze of different colored threads, right? But what happens when you turn it over? It's a beautiful uh, piece of art. And her point was that on this side of eternity, a lot of time life looks very confusing and chaotic, in our attempts to please God and honor Him and trust Him and follow Him. But that when we get to glory and we see the other side, we're going to see a beautiful tapestry that God has painted with our life and was doing it all along, much to our surprise and delight. And that's the story, it seems to me, of the Bible because... <clears throat> 
The most tragic saying in the entire Bible is in John 1. He came into his own, speaking of Jesus, but his own did not receive him. The rejection of the Creator by his creation is the greatest tragedy that ever occurred. But I would submit to you that we are living proof this morning that God turned that ultimate tragedy into the greatest triumph ever because it's through that event that we now have life with God. That we now have life with God. Last thing to mention is that they went as far as Phoenicia, which would be, I guess, modern-day Lebanon, and Cyprus off the coast uh, in the Mediterranean, and Antioch, which would again be in that same area. Keep in mind in the Bible, in the Acts, there are two Antiochs. There's Syrian Antioch, which is just north of Israel on the coast of the Mediterranean, and there's Pisidian Antioch, which is on the Anatolian Peninsula, which is modern-day Turkey. That would be, what, northwest of Israel, I guess? And, and that, those two, this is Syrian Antioch. We're going to hear more about that in this passage. But don't get them confused. But notice that they were only speaking the message of Jesus to Jewish people. And to reiterate something that's very important that we've talked about before is that the biggest issue in the first century church we discover in Acts was... Can anybody who's not Jewish have access to life with God through the Jewish Messiah? In other words, can anybody who's not Jewish follow the Jewish Messiah? I.e., can Gentiles get in on this as well? That was the most um, controversial issue in the first century church. And, and it's amazing, and it's, it's almost humorous, because talk about the tables having turned is nowadays it typically unreached Jewish people are the last people people think of as needing to know their own Messiah I, I would submit to you that they are first in line for the truth about their own Messiah and I think that's reinforced by the words and the actions of Paul the Apostle but my point is that they only were speaking to Jews because, after all, Jesus is Jewish. I didn't say was Jewish. I said is Jewish. And he's the Jewish Messiah. So that was the controversy in the early church. Acts 15 goes into great detail about that and many of the things in Paul's letters. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. Now, the word Greek here is a figure of speech called a metonymy. A metonymy is when you use a subset of a larger group to represent the whole group or a smaller component of some bigger reality to represent the whole thing. And Greeks were non-Jewish Gentiles whose language was primarily Greek but what it's used here is to refer to Gentiles in general. So the point is that what Luke is telling us is that there were some people that came and they started talking to Gentiles about Jesus being the Jewish Messiah. Well, this really got things in a, in a stir. And it says in verse 21, The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Jew, news rather about them reached the church in Jerusalem, the mother church. Hey, up in Antioch, they're telling Gentiles about our Messiah. What are we going to do about that? We got somebody's got to do something about this. So what they do? They sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and large numbers of people added to the Lord. So they send Barnabas to say, Hey, Barnabas, we got something going on up here. We think you're the guy to be our ambassador. Go up there and figure out what's going on. They got Gentiles coming in on the deal, and we don't know what to do with it. So Barnabas goes to check it out and straighten it out. 
Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. Now, Saul, later the apostle Paul, had come to know the Lord when the Lord appeared to him on his way to Damascus to actually persecute followers of Jesus. And he later, in his own writings, discovered, went to Arabia for three years to try to get this all sorted out in his head because it's like, wow, man, I was convinced this guy wasn't the Messiah. It's obvious I was wrong. How do I put all this together? And then he comes back to the church, even in Jerusalem, and they're going, whoa, pal, you're the guy who was trying to kill us not long ago, and now you're claiming to be one of us. We're not really sure about you. So he ends up going back to his hometown of Tarsus up in Asia Minor, uh, up in modern-day Turkey, uh, in that area, rather, region. And he goes up there, and Barnabas, though, knew that the Lord had specifically called Saul of Tarsus to be his ambassador, his representative, to not just Jewish people, but Gentiles also. So when Barnabas goes to Antioch and finds all these Gentiles, these non-Jews becoming followers of the Jewish Messiah, he says, I know the perfect guy to deal with this because God's already called him to this ministry. So Barnabas makes a beeline to Tarsus to get Saul to bring him back to work with these folks whom he knew that the Lord had called him to minister to. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. Now the last sentence, let's read it together of this passage. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, with that passage in its context, we see this tagline, as it were, that Luke, who's the author of Acts, this tagline that he adds here almost as a footnote or an afterthought. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, the word Christian in the original language is the word Christianus, and Christ comes to us from the Greek to the English, but it's the rendering of the Hebrew Mashiach, or Messiah, which means anointed one. So what we have here is this word, Christianus, actually means messianic, or belonging to Messiah. Belonging to Messiah. Now, interestingly, as one Bible commentator points out, in the New Testament, the Christians always name themselves disciples, brothers and sisters, holy ones, believers, etc. But on no occasions did the followers of Jesus call themselves Christians. They never did that. In fact, we see clearly from Luke's account they were called Christians at Antioch. This was a title given to these people who identified themselves with Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah, their Lord, their Savior. This was a title given by people who didn't believe in Jesus about those who did believe in Jesus. This was a title given to them by unbelievers. And what we see from Peter the Apostle is that it most likely was a pejorative. It most likely was a put-down. It most likely was a sarcastic nickname that wasn't intended to be a compliment. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. But if anyone suffers as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. So do you see what's, what seems to be they were called Christians, and then when Peter is reinforcing to believers about being called Christians, he said, don't be ashamed of that, which really lends itself to reinforce the idea that they were called believers by unbelievers, and it likely was used as a sarcastic nickname that was a put-down, not a compliment. Now, that's significant because 
We said that nicknames were usually built around characteristics of our life that stood out to other people, right? And when even the people who don't share your commitment to Jesus recognize that you are committed to Jesus so much so that they would give you a nickname to point that out and even look down their nose at it. What a compliment is that? That they see your identity as inseparable from Jesus. They see your identity as inseparable from Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me that we look, the last three weeks we've been looking at a passage from Acts. And it's interesting to me to see the connection between these three passages that I think is the message that the Lord wants to impress upon us today. And that is this, that two weeks ago... We looked at Acts chapter 4, and we talked about the word that you, Luke used to describe the, the apostles as they stood in front of the same people that had turned Jesus over to be crucified, of whom they had been scared to death weeks earlier. And he used the word parousia, and he uses that to describe the fearless confidence they had in Jesus, even speaking to people who hated the idea of anybody following Jesus and who had already themselves rejected Jesus and turned him over to be crucified. And they stood in the presence of those people and confidently identified themselves with Jesus, fearlessly. So much so that it was said that those to whom they spoke and before whom they affirmed their confidence in Jesus recognized that they had been with Jesus. In other words, even these people recognized that their identity was inseparable from Jesus. And then last week, we looked in Acts chapter 9 when we saw how Paul the Apostle was on his way to Damascus in Syria to find Jews that believed in Jesus and drag them off and have them tried and condemned. And Jesus appears to him from glory, having already ascended back to heaven. Jesus appears to him, and he asks this provocative question, Why are you persecuting me? Which we discovered as we examined that even last week that Jesus so identified with the people who followed him and trusted him and committed their lives to him that he so identified with them that if they were treated a certain way, it was the equivalent of him being treated a certain way. In other words, when something happened to one of Jesus' followers, it happened to him. That's how he was completely identified with those who had trusted Jesus. And then today what we find is that even those who don't share their faith in Jesus and who have an attitude about them, it's so obvious to them that these people completely identify themselves with Jesus of Nazareth that they give them a nickname that calls them those who belong to Messiah. You see, what we need to discover, I think, is the truth that the Apostle Paul alludes to in a direct and dramatic fashion that I think is manifested in all of these realities from the book of Acts and the life of the disciples that he articulates in Colossians 3, 4. Read it with me. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Look at that phrase as we leave that verse up there. Look at that phrase. Who is your life? That line 
is incredible. Are you trusting right now Jesus Christ exclusively for the forgiveness of sin, for a restored relationship with God, and for a life with God now and forever? Are you trusting Christ alone for that? Have you made that decision to surrender to Him and depend completely upon Him? If you've truly made that decision... What the Bible clearly affirms is that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, the life of Jesus has become your life. You are not the person who was born into this world anymore with the life you once had. You have a brand new life. That's the reason when Jesus spoke of the life that he brings and the necessity of somebody who follows him to be born again. You have a brand new existence, a brand new identity, an identity that is based on the very life of God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it means by eternal life in the Bible. You know, so many times we dumb down... The, the phrase eternal life because we think of it as a, as a span of life it has nothing to do with the span of life it has to do with the source and the quality of life in other words everybody's going to live forever somewhere I've read the last page of the Bible this has nothing to do with duration Jesus preached in John 10, he says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And he was speaking to people that were just as alive and breathing as you or me. But if they didn't have his life, the life of God, from God's perspective, they're dead. And what Jesus came to do was to give us his life, the way we were designed to live. I like to use the analogy of, of, of gasoline. You've, you've heard me use it before. You know, we have gasoline vehicles now are made to run on unleaded fuel, right? Well, you, you don't want, want to put diesel fuel in a gasoline car or vice versa because they're not made to run on it. Listen, you were made by God for God, and you were designed to run on His Spirit, period. If you are not enlivened and you are not given life by the Spirit of God, you are dead as dead can be based on the Bible right now. But the Spirit of God, that's the reason baptism, the Bible talks about baptism being a resurrection. We're raised to new life. You know, one of the things that, that we... Uh, fail to do um, in the last millennia. Uh, you remember Jesus with Peter at Caesarea Philippi? G Peter's given birth name Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah. And Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and, and Jesus said, y you're, you're now Peter, Petros, the rock, right? The idea being that Peter, when he acknowledged the truth about Jesus, he got a brand new nickname from Jesus. Well, now in Christian experience and practice, the only time that happens is when the Catholic Church gets a new pope. You know, he always takes a new name, right? Well, that used to, that used to extend out to believers. And Listen... When you're born again, you get a brand new name because you're a brand new person. You are not the same person that used to be. So your birth name naturally is not your new name from God. And the fact that we've lost that, because I think that that implicitly communicates this powerful truth that when somebody comes to Jesus, they become a brand new person in Him. His life is now 
the, the fuel of their existence. And I don't know about you, but I'll take the life of Jesus any day. Because you know what? That's a life that couldn't stay dead. <laughs> they tried to kill him. The Jew is loose. I want a life that transcends death. And right now gives me the chance of being everything God made me to be. Now and forever. <laughs> I knew a Christian man. He was a bold brother. And uh, he loved the Lord. And he, he was full of parousia. Still is. But he had a guy that he had led to the Lord. And the guy said, I want you to preach my funeral. I want you to preach it just the way you preach to me. Okay. So he got up in the funeral home and the body was laying in the casket behind him and he said, half of you in here is deader than this guy in the casket. <laughs> you need to get right. So, you know what? He, the, biblically, he's not wrong. He's not wrong at all. Christ came that we might have life, have his life. If you have turned your life over to Jesus, you have a new identity in Him. You are no longer just yourself. You, we, now live in Christ. Make Jesus Lord of everything you do. I, I tell this, that, you know, husband, how many, how many, don't, no show of hands, how many of us in here are married? How many, you know, how many of you always get along with your spouse? You know, there's never a problem. Never a disagreement, never any issues, right? Well, you no, know, we're still individuals. In fact, we're more ourselves than we've ever been in Christ because He's made us who He made us to be. So we're going to be individuals, and we've got individual um, priorities and tastes and so forth. But even though we're not going to have unanimity, there is nothing that can break our unity as long as He is most important to both of us and our identity is Him. Hallelujah. And, and the reality is, the reality is that Jesus can get along with himself. And if Jesus is living in you and Jesus is living in me and we let him be Lord, he's going to work it out. Let me give you one final question. See, our lives need to look like this. Acts 11, they call them those who belong to the Messiah. Let me ask you a question. What do they call you where you come from? 